Hello, welcome to the College of Education. It's great to have you here on Valentine's Day. Uh, a very special day and we'll be uh, promoting that theme as we go through today. My name is uh, Robert Hausman. I'm the director of our graduate programs for health science education. Um, and so <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I have some paid graduate students in the audience here, so. Um <laughs> Um, it's so good to have all of you here today. We're looking forward to a really dynamic day. It's going to be fun. It's going to be interactive. So I hope you can stay for the entire day. Um, this morning, we're going to have all of our workshops here in this room. So, uh, so I, I encourage you to take full advantage of uh, the time we have with our uh, distinguished speakers. So a couple of just housekeeping kind of things before we get started. Uh, the first thing is, if you haven't signed in and gotten a name tag, critical for today's uh, session. Uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, it's just outside the front door here by the coffee, uh, and uh, the name tags are, are on the right. Please go ahead and sign in and do that. Um, also, if, uh, if you can, we are going to record today's sessions, uh, and we'll break them up and we'll put them online. So please, if you don't mind just uh, keeping the, the cell phones on the, on the vibrate, that would be helpful for us today. Um, and of course, um, we're going, we've got breakfast. I hope you've all taken advantage of our breakfast tacos. They usually go very quickly. And if you don't, we're going to have students lined up here shortly, right? You know, and they're going to take the rest. So, uh, so make sure that you get your breakfast tacos this morning. Um, the restrooms are, are, if you go straight out the back of the building or the, the room here, they're off to the left. So you can go and find the restrooms there um, today. So that's the housekeeping things. So I want to formally welcome you to our Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, this is an inaugural event for our Institute for Global Health Science Education. Um, we are just so excited. It's a very special time at the University of Houston, especially in the area of health science education. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is acknowledge, um, is anyone here from the College of Medicine at the University of Houston? Ah, fantastic. Oh, we've got our group here. Welcome. I'm thrilled for all of you. Uh, you. We just found out, I guess it was this Wednesday, right, that LCME accreditation. This, this means for the College of Medicine at the University of Houston, they can begin to start recruiting medical students. Uh, so congratulations to, uh, to you. I know that they're going to make tremendous contributions to uh, evolving our Texas Medical Center and specifically in the education of uh, medical students uh, uh, really focused on primary care. So that's an exciting thing. Um, uh, anyone from the uh, College of Nursing uh, here, from University of Houston College of Nursing? Uh, former, okay, welcome. So good to have you. We've got people from the College of Optometry here, right? Yes, College of Pharmacy. There, back there, thank you, welcome. We have friends from UT Health. We have friends, welcome, good to see you. We have friends from MD Anderson. Yay. <laughs> from Baylor College of Medicine. Yes. From Texas Children's. Uh, who have I missed uh, here? Yes. Uh, it is so thrilling that we are able to convene this for all of you uh, today. Today's gonna be a very, like I said, fun event because we have some incredible speakers. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Dr. Tom Reeves, we've got Dr. Uh, Kurt Bunk, and uh, later for lunch we'll have uh, Dr. Terry Turner here with us. And so uh, we'll give formal introductions to all of them in, in just a moment. But I want to welcome you here because one of the things that we have in the Texas Medical Center is, is a huge opportunity with the resources, with the intelligence, with the people especially. Um, and uh, here at the College of Education, we're focused on this idea of, of how do we rapidly accelerate the growth of, of education, whether that's K through 12 or whether that's uh, in the health sciences, whether that's medical education, uh, uh, technicians, nursing, all of the things that we just talked about. And we focus this here because we're, we're not the health science experts. Uh, you all are, and, and it's, it's such an awesome thing to be able to collaborate with each of you, whether it's in a class or whether it's in a workshop or the things that we get to do every day. But I have to really acknowledge the fact that we've got uh, uh, Sarah McNeil. I hope, it, where is Dr. McNeil? Is she? Us. Sarah, I want to thank you for really being, I, I, I say she's our fearless leader. Uh, she really is the brainchild for a lot of this programming, and yes, so thank you, Sarah. 
she has really, I think, in, in made this happen today. Everything from the coffee to the drinks to inviting our speakers and making sure that uh, uh, you guys have a really, really awesome time today. So I want to really acknowledge Sarah for, for that. Um, uh, Dr. Susie Gronseth, I think, is right here. Uh, she's going to be making an introduction in just a minute. But uh, Susie, it's an honor to have you here. And I've learned so much. How many have taken a class from Susie? Yes, right? Incredible, right? Uh, uh, so Dr. Granseth has given uh, us so much energy around how do we really improve education, and so it's so good to have you here. Dr. Erwin Hendoko, I hope, is in the room. He's probably doing some important making sure people are getting here kind of work. Uh, uh, these, are, these are the faculty also in, uh, in our program here at the College of Education. Thank you all for all of your work that you've done to make this happen today. Um, I want to, well, in a moment, uh, we, we get our friends from Texas Children's, but uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gita Singhal, uh, if you're here, welcome and, and thank you for all of your support. Um, uh, Dr. Satid, and, and I'm going to say Satid T. T I'm going to try. Tama Tisboon. Ah, yeah, I got it, yes. Uh, um, Satid has been such a great collaborator with us over the years, and so it's an honor to have you here, and thank you so much for all that you do uh, uh, with us. Um, I want to acknowledge, of course, the folks from the College of Medicine who I've gotten to interact with over the last uh, couple of um, uh, uh, semesters, which has been fantastic. Uh, Melanie Lazarus here, thank you so much for... Uh, all you're doing to uh, uh, really promote education, especially in the uh, College of Medicine. So, and of course, a special thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Jeffrey uh, Morgan, who has is, is helped support us uh, in a lot of ways, and I know he couldn't be here today. So, today's session should be, as I said, as interactive as possible. So I want you to sort of take off your inhibitions. Uh, I want you to be able to say, you know what, I would like to explore today. I would like to take a moment to say, you know what, uh, this isn't what I would do in my day job, but uh, today you get to really explore and, and really think from uh, what uh, Dr. Bonk's going to share with us is, is what does it really mean to be a faculty member? Or what does it really mean to be an educator in today's age, especially in health sciences? Uh, what's that role look like? And you're going to hear later today from uh, Dr. Reeves, especially on this idea of, of how do we really transform the potential of education using the education design-based research and using some really fun techniques to be able to make that meaningful. And, and so we're going to learn about that. And of course, many of you have to do scholarship. And uh, Dr. Terry Turner is going to share with us how do we really turn instruction and the things that we do uh, in, in, in our education roles, how do we turn that into scholarship where we can share and disseminate and scale up the practices that we do every day. And so it's going to be a fun day. So with that, I want to welcome Dr. Granseth up uh, uh, to the stage here because she's going to introduce our first distinguished speaker. So Dr. Granseth, thank you so much. <clears throat> So I have the honor of introducing our first speaker for this morning, Dr. Curtis J. Bonk. And sometimes you get the job of doing the introduction to someone that you just met. Uh, but this, Kurt is somebody that I've known for quite a while. Um, I was a graduate student at Indian University in Bloomington. And he, he was one of the faculty members that I had a class with that really inspired so a lot of the ways that I teach and design instruction today. And so he's really been instrumental in um, the ways that I think about creative learning, collaboration, critical thinking, and how to be productive in scholarship. He has, for instance, published more than 300 articles, given more than 1,600 talks, and authored or edited 12 books, including uh, quite a few that we'll be giving away today. The newest book is uh, MOOCs and Open Education in the Global South, which was just released uh, a few months ago um, by Routledge. And uh, Dr. Tom Reeves is also uh, an editor on that book. And he really is a connector. One of his nicknames is The Node. And so he either knows you or you know somebody that he knows. It's almost like the six degrees of separation with Kevin Bacon, but it's with Kurt Bonk. So we are all connected somehow back to him. He is, he is definitely the connector, and if, if he doesn't know you, he will get to know you. So do reach out to him and, um, and meet him at some point today. 
He, um, a few more accolades. Um, he has, let's see, he has the adding tech variety, 100 plus activities for motivating and retaining learners online. Um, that's been downloaded nearly 100,000 times since it was published in May of 2014. He is a professor of instructional systems technology at Indiana University. He has a lot of resources that he'll be sharing today and they are all available online on his website, kurtbonk.com. Um, and many, 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 many more accolades, but I, um, I'm just so excited that we can kick off our, our session today and uh, welcome Kurt Bonk. You've got the handout in front of you that has the one side that looks like so, and the other handout's kind of filled in. There are 30 ways that technology is changing learning and teaching, and I've tried to umbrella them from the three stand standpoints of engagement, access, and customization or personalization. Uh, so we're going to have a chance to fill that in. But I've written an article that has it talks about all 30. So if you go to publicationshare.com, you can download my free articles, any open access ones, including that one about how learning is changing. If just one of those technologies had happened, if just online happened or blended or MOOCs or virtual reality, it'd be, well, I, I'm cheating if I tell you, I think it would be a revolution. But we have 30 things happening. I'm going to let you decide if it's a revolution or not, OK? On your note cards, you could write questions for me and give them to me. And I'll, I'm going to be at, back at, uh, after lunch, two breakout sessions. This one is big picture, OK? The other two are hands on in the trenches. If you come to any, either of those, I guarantee five or six things you're going to use in your classroom. Uh, critical thinking, creative thinking, collaborative learning, motivation, using technology in the classroom. I'm going to go through my two frameworks for using technology in the first breakout. The first breakout is more technology integration with my tech variety model and my Star Wars model, R2D2. In the second breakout, I will go through generic things you can use in face-to-face -face classrooms and video conferencing or anything, and uh, training people on the street. So the, uh, the late one will be an, an easy one. If your brain is mush, come to the, la the latter session because it's going to be easy to, to uh, integrate some of those. If your brain's not mush, come to the first breakout. <laughs> I did bring, so the Tech Variety book is downloadable in Chinese. I notice we have some Chinese people. It's been downloaded 20,000 times in Chinese and actually 100,000 in English plus 100,000 more of chapters. So it's free at techvariety.com, T-E-C variety or T-E-C-H if you want to. Anyway, I'll give away 30 copies today. So I'll give away maybe 10 this morning. We'll see. People who laugh at my jokes will get copies. So, and I was playing around with my slides before Robert came up here, so engage. I'm try and engage you in reverse, and so you'll see the entire talk in front of your eyes, stream in front of you, because we don't exactly have it queued up. So this talk is called uh, Meaningful Health Sciences Instruction in the Digital Age. And some of the examples, I've spent the last week reading health science research and, and pedagogy, and I just spoke at Fort uh, Sam to Army medics the last two days and to Air Force people and so forth and Navy people and has filled these talks up with medical and, and healthcare examples. So uh, especially this afternoon, you'll see lots of healthcare related examples. I've learned about radiology, optometry, pharmacology, nursing. So my brain is mush after this week. It's been so when meaningful health sciences instruction stumbles, uh, when evolution stumbles into, into revolution. Meaningful health sciences instruction in the digital age. We shouldn't stumble. We should plan for some things. Well, it's okay once in a while to stumble. But you're here all, all of you are here now to kind of think about the curriculum that maybe you're designing in the new medical program. So you shouldn't be stumbling in. Of course we should experiment and take risks every once in a while. But the entire curriculum shouldn't be a risk. We should, we should not be falling and stumbling in t over time. I noticed my, my clicker, oh, there we go. Okay, so you see Mary Decker here falling and stumbling. Many of you have stumbled into love, and today is Valentine's Day, right? Others of you have been more planful about that. In fact, some of you could go to the zoo in San Antonio or the El Paso Zoo 
And if you broke up with your spouse or your significant other, you could um, buy him a cockroach and uh, feed it to a, a snake and so forth for $5. Only in Texas do you see this kind of thing. For $30, you can buy a rodent and feed it to a snake, but uh, $5 for a cockroach and, and yeah, a new symbol of Valentine's Day, unfortunately. But yeah, that's not the planning I'm talking about here, okay? I hope you don't do that, unless you're trying to get them funding. You're hopefully creating reports and plans and technical reports, and that's why places like Korea and Singapore are leaders in the e-learning space, because they plan for it. Americans. You know, we haven't had the national leadership for such in, until recently. So I've been reading, you know, I read your report from 2018, uh, the College of Medicine report for the University of Houston. It's great, you know, it's great. You see up here, they're trying to think, they're thinking about flipping the classroom and case-based reasoning and team-based learning and project-based learning and collaborative learning and all sorts of innovative pedagogies are, are mentioned throughout the document. I recommend you all download this and read it and you get a sense of what might be happening, what might exist in five years or in three years in Houston if I was to come back and visit and, and all. You can read other reports like the Horizon Report out of the New Media Center in Austin. It's been taken over by an organization called Educause. And Educause now offers the annual Horizon Report free. They predict what's going to happen in one year, two years, five years. And it's a simple report. It's not a long report. And you've got the various technologies that are discussed in here, and you've got learning analytics, uh, you've got blockchain and virtual, virtual agents a little further out, uh, mobile in, in the next couple of years, in very short and brief summaries. You need these frameworks, you need these reports to kind of get, think about, but you need to extend beyond them. This afternoon in the first breakout, I will go through my two frameworks, Tech Variety and R2D2, and maybe you can use one of them. Maybe you'll develop your own. But do take a look at this one. Uh, they have a Horizon report for K-12 as well. And they have a Horizon port, report for community college as well. The reason I say that, because we have a lot of people being displaced in, in society. While we may gain 133 million jobs over the next couple of years, we're gonna lose 58 million and we have to retrain and retool and rethink. <coughs> robotics are changing things. You saw my slide up there that was talking about robotics and I have do a little, there we go. Uh, I'm just going to show snippets of different things. We see the robot here developed in Japan talking to the other robot in a conversation. Do you want, do you want to have a discussion on who the greater pop icon is? Lady Gaga versus Taylor Swift. The definition of Android is very human-like robot. Uh, at least appearance and movement and, 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 and the talks, they should be human-like. The robot is you know, just a combination of a sensor and actuator and the computers. Okay, that was the short version. I have another version that's longer. If you download the slides, you will see that uh, there's various versions up there right now. So you can use these. They're all, they're all uh, cut for, for all of you to possibly use. We're moving away from Education 1.0 in Thailand. They're trying to do Education 4.0. Three years ago, they had me talk about Education 4.0, and uh, five years ago they had me talk about Education 3.0, but they're n still not educa at Education 2.0, so I don't know why they had me predict what's going to happen next, but, you know, I remember the milkman, and I remember the, the TV repairman, I don't remember the, the Chandler or the cobbler, maybe Tom Rees remembers those folks, they'll talk about, they'll talk later, uh, but those, you know, uh, educating people for the Education 1.0 age is, is gone. And we no longer can rely on didactic direct instruction. We need it for 20% of what we do. We should still lecture and then have 20% exploration and 20% collaboration and 20% competition and 20% group discussion. We should vary and utilize the plethora of resources in front of us to explore. I've got the monster syllabus. If you go to my homepage, I have a 100-page syllabus and everything's in exploration in the link. I'm a curator of the content. I'm a concierge for them. And it's all free, all the articles are free, Every, they don't have to buy, and it's a week on virtual reality, a week on mobile learning, a week on e-books, which is a big thing here at Houston. I know you've got an open ed e-book project or e-textbook project, blended learning a week. You download it off my homepage if you'd like to find out where we're going with technology. 
Education 2.0, the instructor is a guide on the side. And 30 years ago, I designed a learning center in Wheeling, West Virginia, and that's me, I hate to admit. Uh, 30 years ago, working with Reader Rabbit and, you know, Mop Town Hotel and Rocky's Boots and Math Blaster and all these technologies, and I was a guide on the side, and that was the big thing in cognitive psychology. Because after I was a board accountant, she, Susie didn't mention, I'm, a, I'm kind of a boring guy if you hadn't heard, figured it out by now. And I left accounting for educational psych, the big thing in the late 80s was cognitive science, and so I did my master's about around all these kinds of games and, that existed, like Rocky's Boots and Mop Town Hotel, because the instructor became that guide on the side. And if your goal in, the, in your program is to create an instructor as a guide on the side, you're 30 years behind, okay? Because we're moving into the age of education 3.0 and 4.0, where we're co-developing, we're co-creating as colleagues, with our students, we're, we're uh, leading de design efforts in our classrooms. We're trying to have students generate and produce, not just receive knowledge. And how we curate the golden nuggets that are available for our students to explore in our classrooms is what's important. So we move on to the age of innovation and learners creating, knowledge producing, not just you know, receiving the, the textbook knowledge and the publishers providing the multimedia elements in there, that's important still, but it shouldn't be the only thing. And so my students design wiki books and YouTube-like videos, and they do their podcast shows and documentaries and all sorts of things that try to engage them in the process. I also let them pick and choose the assignments that they want that fit the, their needs and so forth. I provide that, that framework for them to do so. Because we're in the learning age, Make no mistake, this is no longer the industrial age, or even, we shouldn't even call it the information age. This is the learning age, and I've got my mobile attached to me. I can be learning all the time, and I am, and you are too. You're, some of you are checking your, I noticed you were checking Facebook, so, <laughs> or LinkedIn, or whatever you are. So it's usually the people in the back, yeah, she closed it right now, way in the back. There's some people in the back row, see, I, she's still guilty. So, my former student, Roe v. Brandon, at the University of Washington, uh, has been talking about, and he, he's, a, he's the dean or the pr uh, vice provost of the Continuum College. It used to be called Continuing Studies. All the other deans are jealous of him because he's got 40,000 students that are never going to go away. They're going to keep learning. People keep graduating. He has all the alumni, basically. And people, will, if we live longer lives, thanks to medical people, 100-year lives, we're going to have to retool constantly. And, you know, wh what are the ways that we're going to be learning? And you see MOOCs and YouTube libraries, MOOC uh, videos, just accessing and shared online video from YouTube and TED Talks and TED Ed and Clip Chef and Master Chef and MedTube and SchoolTube. We can go to short courses and take those, you know, micro credentials, stack up a couple of short courses or MOOCs and get a certificate or go to Code Academy or hackathons and, and uh, receive your, you know, your training in Python programming and get a $60,000, $100,000 job just from a short stay, why come to college for four years when you can do that? Or go on to get professional certificates online, and there are many universities doing just that, providing online education. We need to create learning environments. We need to be learning environment engineers as instructional designers or flexible learning consultants. That's what the Aussies use. Isn't that great? Why, why be an instructional designer when you can be a flexible learning consultant, you know? So, you know, we need to be more like Starbucks. And at Indiana University, we have the Mosaic Project for active learning. And we're getting students engaged in the learning process by rethinking space. And right now, we're rethinking our School of Ed space. And many spaces on campus have been retooled and re redesigned just for that. Like uh, these cafes. In Scotland, in Caledonian University, they built a building where the first floor was social, the second floor was uh, collaborative, the third floor was individual workstations, and the fourth floor was counseling. Every level of the building stood for a different kind of learning. And if you flew over the building, it, it had lettering on the top of the building describing what was going on in the building that day for learning. And this, this Starbucks approach is one way of rethinking education because we have digital learners, learners who are savvy in the digital world and the computer world. They move in and out, and they don't even know it. They're just equally adept at using technology and sitting here in the room and, and adapting. Just, it's, it doesn't take much. And we have to think about that those kinds of learners and not ban 
cell phones. And when the Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, they, they had been banning cell phones. And uh, my friend in Puerto Rico asked me to design training. My students as a class designed training to train teachers how to use mobile for students because that's the only way kids could learn for a while. And the only way kids could learn after Hurricane Katrina, you know, in Mississippi and Louisiana, they banned online learning until Hurricane Katrina. They banned online learning in China for only select universities could do it until SARS. They didn't have an university, uh, online university in Haiti until the earthquake. Smithsonian build content for kids after each one n one. The state of Ohio loves it. They no longer have snow days. They have blended learning days, and the kids hate it. But we need to be re we need to be proactive, not reactive, because we have the Netflix age. We are binge learners today, and I love that notion of binge learning. That's the way I learn. You know, I can focus for a while and get it done, and move on to something else. Why are we segmenting out 15 weeks? I like teaching my eight-week course, and many believe in the four-week kinds of course. We need to rethink the packaging of the contents and the delivery of those contents. Because learning is clearly changing for all of us, in front of our eyes. And it's a fascinating time to be an educator. This is the most wondrous time to be in, in your shoes and, and my shoes. This is a, it's a delight to you know, think about what we can do. And those kids at Dubai Men's College are sharing. My friends there are sharing what's going on. And 10 years ago, we did not share on our laptops and desktops and so forth. We're in the sharing age. And we have to rethink the role of the instructor. Is it a counselor? You know, uh, giving advices to students. I think the, uh, the number one job in the future will be someone who has some human development or counseling related skills because there's so many paths that we could wander in. We're going to need those advisors. We're going to need that, those people to go to that, that can uh, guide our way and, cr and help us with our paths. But we'll also need consultants as instructors those that know something about the real world and can teach us about how to adapt our, our ideas to an authentic learning setting and, and what might work and what might not work and when to hold back and when to go for it. And we need those orchestra conductors who can make, make a symphony of all the rich contents, all the podcasts, all the, the video files and animations and simulations and VR and AR. We need to weave those things together to excite our learners and create a unique orchestra experience and we need to be course ambassadors who share our work. We put our syllabus online. In 1997, UCLA mandated its syllabi to go online. And faculty protested. There were protests out in the front. And the students joined them because they were charged a fee for those syllabi online. Today's different age, you know. It was top down back then. It should be bottom up or both. But we're course ambassadors with MOOCs online. We're, we're, we're um, promoting our content to the world. We are world educators, global educators. You know, I was a professor at Penn State who taught 200 students. And in December, he taught anatomy, and he put self-tests self up on anatomy. How many, of those, how many students do you think used his website in December before final exams? 200 students. What do you think? Just shaking your head. Any guesses? You get a book. Well, you don't need a book. 200,000. We are course ambassadors. We are curators of the best content and making it on display and putting it on display for our students. The best of the best to excite and put something in the back office and bring it out when you need to. I like concierge. Most people who are talking about this pick this metaphor. You have to pick your metaphor or an assembly of metaphors. I like concierge. I used to play the Who Magic Bus song in, at the start of my class. You know, and it's kind of like a tour guide. But, you know, I'm, I'm a concierge gives people different things depending upon the weather, depending upon where we are in the curriculum. I, I, I give them on different paths, like the node might do. Um, and, and, and I find that to be maybe a combination, actually, curator, concierge. But there's 20 different roles that I'm going to be talking about in my next book, Education 2020, and those are just a few. They all start with the letter C. You know, Obama might pick community organizers. Others of you might pick uh, chemist and so forth, caregiver, coach. Uh, and I'll be f focusing on this changing role because no longer is it just imparting knowledge. And you see the many roles that we have in front. It makes it exciting. It makes it really exciting to be an educator, but it also makes it quite a challenge. And we can never really go to, sometimes never go to sleep at night, as Susie knows. <laughs> Late at night, I've heard texting in, and they, oh, what, what do you think about this? What do you think? You know, so, so I've also come up with, um, well, David Merrill has the first principles in, 
instruction about you know applying what you know and demonstrating what you know and and getting at one's prior knowledge and integrating your learning and problem-based learning so I said I can't have the the first principles so I have the last principles okay this is a, the learning activation system template last and I'll just give you a sense of some things you have to be flexible I have multiple due dates but what students don't realize it's due December 8th and December 1st it used to just be December 8th. Now I make it due early if they want. They think I'm being kind, but I actually have the first, it's due the first or the eighth. I have a grace period of two days, five days, one day. It all depends. What I do every semester is different. What the grace period depends on the task. I got this semester a two day grace period on the simple task, five day grace period on the harder ones because I cannot grade them all at once. Why am I you know, having them turn in stuff that I can't even grade? So flexible agenda. I'm teaching courses in reverse from the last module to the first module. That's been real interesting after 25 years of teaching it one way. I went to module five and went backwards. It was great. Um, and now it's 30 years in. Principal convenience. You know, students are you know, full-time working or have kids, so make it convenient to turn in papers in Dropbox or in Canvas or Blackboard, whatever you're using, or you know, under my door or you know, email. I just make it you know, how, however they can get it to me. To me. You know, make, make uh, yourself kind of a colleague when you can. Work with your students. I've published with students, you know. I've added, and, and sometimes we've done conference presentations together. I introduce them to colleagues. I introduce them to people uh, as a colleague at a conference or online in Zoom will bring someone in and I, I, I try to treat them as colleagues. They recommend people to bring in Zoom. The number one principle of the 20 is the principle of optimism because we have so much negativism in the last couple of decades. I didn't say the last couple of years, the last couple of decades. And I think we need to be more positive and be more encouraging to our students and that will go a long way with raising the standards, raising the bar. If you can do both, have a positive climate as well as productive one. I call that P squared, positive and productive. Optimism. High expectations, so I post student work, and I post better work, and the and next semester I'll post even better work, and the bar keeps going higher and higher. I'll ask students if I can make their work available for next semester. The principle of choice and options. So I give students 10 assignments, you pick any four. I used to teach online, I give them four, and I say, those are the four you have, and they hated me for it, you know. I used to give them articles to read, and they had to read certain ones, and they hated me for it. And I told my assistant, Emily Hickson, I said, you can give them feedback every week and reminders, because they're going to hate you. Well, I found out they loved Emily sending them reminders and all that. And so I started sending reminders so they liked me a little bit better. And uh, I gave them, I let them choice within the articles to read. Why am I deciding what a future school counselor is going to read? What a future uh, librarian or what a future corporate trainer? They're not all supposed to read the same articles in my learning theory class. Let them read what they want. So, so a lot of choice and a lot of options are built in the system. You can go to my syllabi. Give them some autonomy. Some professors let the students negotiate the syllabus in a wiki. When I come back from sabbatical, I go on in May, when I come back, I'm not going to be able to recreate the monster syllabus because it's 100 pages. I got migraines from the last time. I applied ice cubes to my head, literally, for about two hours to go to sleep. I'm going to have students design the syllabus, okay? Um, you know, have students do final presentations. I have students bring in quotes from the articles we read and present the articles instead of me lecturing. They bring in visuals of the articles we read. Uh, and we put them on the walls, posters, and they describe the, with the research and the flaws and the limitations of the findings. I have students who summarize a researcher's articles in a PowerPoint and then I bring that researcher in and my students play the PowerPoint and have the researcher react to their own slides, their own comments. It's a wonderful thing. It's, you know, professors will say, I'm too busy to come to your class. I say, no, my students will create your, your talk for you. And they'll say, cool, I'll come into your class. And so it's a win-win. They got to read the research. They got to understand the person. You know, give feedback. I mean, teaching with technology requires a lot of feedback. So you have critical friends in the class giving feedback. You have uh, prior students who come back and give feedback. You might have system feedback, like the Penn State professor who built a system. You might have instructor feedback or co-instructor feedback with TAs. I treat my TAs as co-instructors. 
you might have peer feedback, built-in feedback. Students want feedback on everything they do with, with online. And face-to-face, -face, you don't give feedback to everyone, so you have to build that in. So those are the 20 principles. I only went through eight because of time. Um, I'm pushing it as it is, but I wanted to give you a sense of the Education 2020 perspective. If you do some of these things, not all, if you do some of these things, I'll sort of put a, a bonk guarantee that you'll increase engagement somehow. You'll increase motivation, and that's this book, so Increase Motivation and Engagement. The gentleman on the left there is Charles Vest, and the gentleman on the right, uh, Charles Wedemeyer. Charles Wedemeyer tried to create an open university at Wisconsin-Madison, where I went. They didn't do it, so he went to the UK and built the first open university. He has a book called Learning at the Back Door. It's a, you see this young, this young Russian kid wasn't allowed into the elitist school, whereas the other kid had all sorts of resources. And, you know, I had a including on the ACT, I couldn't get into Lower Potomac State University with that test score. But today you can learn from Stanford and Oxford and Cambridge, and I've spoken at, all, at those places. Um, and Charles Vest said, let's make it free. All MIT is free. When I was growing up, nothing was, t I couldn't go to MIT. I was too stupid and so forth. Now I can learn from, M I'm doing research with those open course for from MIT. And so Charles Vest and Charles Wedemeyer have changed the world for learners. And I recommend getting the book Learning at the Back Door for $1 used on Amazon, 1981. Everything is still relevant today for the non-traditional learner. Learning anything from eyeball to eyeball, ear pan to ear pan learning. So I have a book called The World is Open, which kind of builds on that and go through 10 trends like Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, but for education. And I'll give it away at some point. So when I go someplace now, if I go to Singapore, this is the way people greet me as they see me. When I go to Bangkok, that's how they greet me today. When I go to Illinois, I don't like going to Illinois. I'm from Wisconsin. I'm now in Indiana. But I go once in a while, and they greet me. They still greet me in Illinois and in Indiana as well. And when I go off to the Philippines, that's how they greet me. So I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to get in my next talk. So <laughs> if I could, if you could all... I got you all. Okay, up in the air. Great, all right. <laughs> You'll show up in Bangladesh or something, you know. So now we're in an age where anyone can learn anything from anyone else at any time. That's the premise of this book. So Cassandra Brooks is an Antarctic researcher. Every night, a good friend of mine, she came into my class last year. She studies the Antarctic toothfish. I ate it the other day. It's called the Chilean sea bass. Um, I shouldn't have eaten it because I listened to her and it's being depleted. Uh, but, you know, she uploads her research for kids in schools around the world at night at 11 o'clock at night on the, on the boat, on the cutter that's going. And she's got a stop motion video that CNN picked up on. If you uh, type in Cassandra Brooks uh, video, it's a fascinating video through Antarctica. Um, today, we have many, many ways besides video that's changing the world. Collaborative learning, self-directed learning, global learning with video conferencing, open education, massive open education. You know, these are the three rings that you've got in front of you. I want you to take a second. I'm sorry, I don't have much time, but I want you to list some, one idea or two ideas next to one of those boxes. How do you engage learners? How do you provide access? How do you customize the learning process? I want you to write at least one thing real quick down in there. See if you've got an idea. I started and I have 31 minutes or more. Excuse me. It says 31 minutes on my timer. Now, you've got the cheat sheet. I think you got this, the one that's filled in, right? Uh, I want you to share what you've written down so far with somebody next to you or at your table and look at the cheat sheet and see, see if you match anything. If anyone's got a match, I want you to raise your hand and you'll get up. The first one who does will get a book, and the second one who does will get a book. Give a third one away. That, that'll be good. 
The lady there, Susie, uh, uh, Sarah, right there, she's, she's got her hand up. What's your name? Back. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? We've got to get a, some, a gentleman. We've got two ladies. Has any gentleman found a match in here? Are we all thinking about Valentine's Day and what you forgot to buy? You know? Okay, right, right back there, right back there, way in the back. The gentleman there, Sarah, to your right, to your left. Okay. Can you catch her or am I going to hit all the stuff? You throw it to her. Back behind you. All right. Thank you for playing the game. <clears throat> Short the game that it was. You know, 30 things. It's hard to keep track. We're all swamped. We're all frustrated. I'm frustrated too. The stacks at home are just eat me up, and I had to re learn all this medical stuff on top of it during the past couple of weeks. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to bed early, let me tell you, four o'clock. Um, but I want to know if I can get some kind of credential. Um, anyway, uh, you know, this is one way to help reduce your tension. Frameworks will help. And this afternoon's more so than this morning's, actually. This is big picture. I'm trying to think about how do we engage the, the learners out there. And some people do it through rich, media, digital media. And Drexel University has done something cool. My friend Susan Aldridge, who's the president of Drexel Online, she's created Virtually Inspired. And at Virtually Inspired, she's collected all the universities around the world, simulations and animations, and in particular, quite a few medical related ones and health science related ones. And if you go and take a look at virtuallyinspired.org, they have many nursing uh, um, simulations and um, radiology and you name it, uh, as you can see, some of those that are listed up here, uh, some are gaming related from Coventry University in the UK, some have AR and VR, but these are all free to download and use in your classroom. So it's spend an hour exploring sites like this and you'll be amazed what you'll be able to find. This afternoon I'll be able to go more in depth than I can here uh, right now. From Australia with Monash University, to the UK, all around the world. They've been collecting all these uh, various sites, as we can see, uh, the virtual mobile lab and holography and you know, all 3D worlds and so forth. The other one is harvardmedsim.org that I discovered. So I kind of stumbled upon this one. The other one I knew about because Susan told me, and I, I actually was an evaluator of it early on. So this is another one, digital and, and resource rich that you might explore, and they have different ones, different really to clinical training and nursing and so forth, uh, that one, Harvard Med Sim. Uh, now I get into some VR uh, and AR related things, and uh, I, can, I can now uh, tell you that I don't see a single thing. I don't know why I put this on, but I just thought, what the heck, I brought it with me in my suitcase for about you know, the last five days, I gotta wear it for five seconds to make sense of why the heck I brought this in. Anyways, and I got the clicker too and so forth. Let me show you if we can play some of these. So this is augmented reality and this one doesn't have audio with it. And you see him is rotating the heart and exploring the heart and the muscle and so forth and uh, trying to make sense of what he sees. That's very short and very simple. We've got virtual orchestra. We've got a lot of things. We got we got doctors making decisions about their surgery from the micro, from the HoloLens from Microsoft. Planning the surgery, pre-planning the surgery.
you'll see in the slide in a second. I'm showing a couple in a row. I was, instead of switching back and forth, here's chemistry, students exploring their chemistry. As a person who never took chemistry, I got excited. Because I might have, I might have actually taken chemistry after watching this. lots of these. Trauma unit. I think this is from UCLA. They've moved away from mannequins to virtual training. Doctor, this is a one-year-old male found by the mother at home having a seizure. The seizure's been lasting about seven minutes. Blood glucose on scene was 90. Doctor, what do you want to do? Are you just going to let him die? So then he explains the, the system and, and the costs involved, and I'll skip over some of that and we'll see if we can get back to the, the patient here. Where, you know, their mistakes wouldn't necessarily cause harm. And the standard simulation that we have now, we have mannequin-based simulation, which is very costly. Oh, it looks like we lost that People part involved, involved both to run. Let's see what we got next. I'll go back to the slides for a moment. Okay, so virtual reality is starting to get into the classroom. And we see, <laughs> wonderful, I hit the end button. <laughs> Only I could do that. Okay, where are we gonna go? We gotta go back to the beginning somewhere. There we are, we're about right. Yeah. Okay, that's where I was. I won't hit that end button again. So, thinking about how VR and AR might enhance our instruction, the, the fidelity of the instruction, Engage. the engagement brought on. Now, this chemistry video had a video had a video discussion wrapped around it. They have Vialogs. Vialogs is a video discussion tool. I think developed at Teachers College Columbia, and Teachers College has like a newsletter every week online called New Learning Times that covers new new technology changes around the world. It's really cool. Once a week, so you can subscribe to New Learning Times. And this is a tool, I think they use Vialogs a lot, so you see the discussion. So while they watch the video, they annotate or discuss. Don't just watch videos, but annotate them, or go to Tube Chop and chop them up into little pieces to, to emphasize concepts and so forth. Uh, learning is more immersive in that, that video I just showed you in the trauma unit, scenario-based learning with challenges built into it. Emergency firefighters in California. The headset I'm wearing comes from uh, Regatta uh, VR, which is in Bloomington, Indiana. It's a little startup, and they're doing uh, sexual harassment training, uh, empathy training, and emergency preparedness training in California like this, and training firefighters for the fires that they're now seeing um, all across the, the state and beyond. And we also have learning becoming more, more augmented, augmented reality have that one here. So we can look at our food in a restaurant before ordering food. And you might see different items on the menu pop up, and then I can decide what I want to eat. Uh, the night before last in San Antonio, they gave us a menu. I couldn't decide what to get. It was a real short and brief menu, and the food was delicious. I had no idea how, how great the food was going to be. I was going to walk out of the restaurant. Uh, it just, it, nothing looked good uh, according to the menu. I'm pr kind of a picky person, but the helpings, the octopus, my God. Uh, yeah. uh, learning is more uh, game-like. Let me show you this on the gaming side here.
these games that we're creating is mostly for practicing physicians and other healthcare providers uh, to basically practice their craft in some sense while also having fun. They play our games, uh, they come in and it's totally free to them. So they, a lot of out of interest, a lot of trying to apply their own medical knowledge and skills to a game environment is, is quite interesting for them. And then also we provide CME for some of our physicians. CME being uh, continuing medical education credits. So doctors have to do it's uh, and so we actually provide some of those uh, based on our games uh, and we have certified uh, release of credits for them to maintain the license. I am a pediatric ear, nose, and throat surgeon, so I uh, primarily work with children um, with ear, nose, and pro uh, throat problems. My primary focus area has been on um, complex airway, airway reconstruction, complex swallowing. Um, I also do sleep apnea and a couple other things, in, in mostly in kids. A lot of the questions that we get is, you know, okay, this is a 2D touchscreen. You're not in the actual operating room. You're not in front of a simulator. How are they learning anything? And so I think um, from an education perspective, um, it's a lot about that decision analysis, the decision making, the analysis of what's going on, and the order of things that you need to do them to successfully complete something. Um, because there's a lot of multiple things happening at once. You again these slides and take a look at yourself uh, and explore them on your own. So learning's become more game-like, and I currently have a study with people at North Texas, University of North Texas, on the gamification of MOOCs and uh, what's possible and what people are doing and, and what the future holds. And so a lot of people are now downloading the games, um, I guess it's a game called Out, uh, Plague, Plague, Plague Inc. Uh, for the cor um, coronavirus to start understanding the coronavirus. There are also simulations, hands-on simulations at places like our IUPUI, um, uh, our Indianapolis-based university, to get nurses as much high fidelity as possible much real world as possible when they're trained. There's, um, according to this, there's only 100 simulation labs in the world, and IU is among those, probably you'll be among those too. Not only is learning more game-like, but learning's more mobile. And, uh, you know, it's smaller, smaller. Learning's becoming in smaller bits and smaller technologies. Uh, we have, with Fitbits, it's extremely small. Uh, we have so much mobile, it's taking over our lives. And when you go to the restaurant, to, like I did in uh, Hong Kong, I was sitting next to eight young people who didn't talk to themselves the entire hour at dinner. Each of the eight were just checking their mobiles. It's like zombies in the subways of Taiwan and Hong Kong. You know, and there's a guy who in Seattle who ran into a bear while checking his mobile. People in California who walked off a cliff while checking their mobile. So we have to be careful about overdoing it and so forth. And learning is also more social. And this is important because Vygotsky said learning first is social. Even Tom Hanks and Castaway talked to the volleyball. It was a social experience first, then it moves to be an individual experience. Let's see if I can show this one. It's kind of cool. I'll just show a piece of this one. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. Oh, what is this? Hey, Portal, call Lauren. You can see up here, right? Yeah. Run past it like quick and <laughs> Thank God, have to rinse it in the sink. Now, you have a knife? Whoa! Kiara, <laughs> a scooter developed in the Renaissance. Fascinating. I. 16! Then. Now up. Time to double time. I'm getting a cramp. Yum, 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 Casey, it's nice to see you today. Yeah, there's a lot happening in this world of uh, social um, networking, in the world of synchronous instruction, uh, and in the world of AI. Today, right now, historical sites are disappearing, but artificial intelligence can help us bring history back to life. If you don't know where you come from, you don't know where, where you go. We use Microsoft AI to help us reproduce historical places. I need to make it possible because it's so important to do it. To recreate the sites, we had to stitch hundreds of pictures one by one. 
Microsoft's artificial intelligence. We are able to stitch hundreds of thousands of pictures in one night. It was just a representation of the site. With this technology, you can go in, you can experience it. Let's go in another place. I'm ready for the next one. Artificial intelligence lets us experience our past. It helps us create our future. We saw him on the Super Bowl, if you remember. Uh, that's Microsoft's big push into the AI space. But learning is more social for all of us with LinkedIn, with Twitter, with blogging, with Facebook. I have WeChat on my phone and Line and um, what's the other one I've got on here? I've got three of these things now. Uh, Kakao Talk for Korea. You know, learning is also more collaborative. My friend here on the, on the right, Marcel, is created Chatterbox. Her mother was an uh, immigrant to the UK from Afghanistan and she found it was um, a her able to use her language to teach others. She built a platform or a tool for refugees and for migrants to teach a language, the native language, to others and get an income from that. And she's going to be a guest in my class in a couple of weeks, actually. Very inspiring person. And there's a lot of these kinds of programs today, online learning programs in Germany, free to the world, for, for refugees, because it takes a year to process their information. They can take an online course first. As I said, learning is more visual uh, in terms of watching a recreation of Rome or some other city in Italy. We have a professor at Indiana who's created Rome Reborn. Uh, that's, been, that's a real famous website, it's won all sorts of awards, and my students are going to visit him in a couple of weeks and see how he goes about that and all these cultural heritage sites. Because he's on sabbatical right now in Italy developing another one. You notice the woman here hold, having the headset like I had on, and above the kids' heads are their test scores. So you could use augmented reality this way. You can see what students need help with their problems and what ones don't, and so you can personalize the instruction. Learning is more immersive. Part two is learning is pervasive, and I'm, part two and three are a little bit faster and I won't show as many videos, so hopefully you can get through some of these. Uh, but access through video, access through synchronous like Zoom or the FaceTime, access, you know, having experts in, in a MOOC who teach a class, informal through Wikipedia and TED Talks. You know, all around the world, learning has become more and more informal. 80 to 90 percent of learning is informal. We're just validating that today. Which is, you know, my research eight to ten years ago was about informal learning through things like Wikipedia and TED Talks and other kinds of means. And uh, it's a fascinating area to explore today. Um, learning is also more free. Increasingly people are repackaging MOOCs, repackaging free and open um, contents to create the freshman year of college curriculum for free for people so you don't go into debt right away or to, to have advanced placement courses and kids can take their advanced placement courses after learning from the free and open courseware and so forth. And in Africa and Rwanda, they're repackaging American contents, creating an undergraduate curriculum in the virtual uh, African uh, virtual university, virtual African university. There I have a chapter in my new book. So here at, at University of Houston and at Rice, there's a big open textbook project, one called Open Stacks at, at Rice University. There are other ones. Other players, big players, British Columbia and Ontario, the provinces, and the University of Minnesota, where they talk funny up there, yeah. Um, but you see large undergraduate college instruction, biology, sociology, psychology, and so forth, are offered, you know, offering people a free book a free textbook. My book is free online. And they're saving students money. And other places that weren't intended to be using it are using this outside the U.S. Many high schools and, and colleges are using the OpenStax project. And Modern State Alliance is one of the places that has formed to create a free college experience or free credits. They repackaged all this um, content to create a, a three, three credit courses that are free for students. Uh, learning is also more video-based, and if you go to my homepage, click on web resources or just resources now, I redid the homepage, you'll see 80 portals like YouTube. YouTube isn't the only thing, there is MedTube, as there are many medical related and food related with Clip Chef and Master Chef. Uh, but we learn through video, we might learn through a short video to anchor learning. A two minute video can then serve as a springboard for a project or an activity. Um, or something else that you're doing in class, and you can come back to that video later on. 
you might show something in the news that's, that's available by video or by podcast. Let's see if we've got it. And so in the news. The number of deaths are rising and cases are spreading across borders. World health leaders are now deciding if the new coronavirus constitutes an international emergency. That was a couple of weeks ago. I guess now you would call it definitely an international uh, emergency. You know, there's much more online. I, about 20 years ago, I was part of the Army Research Institute, or a fellow, and we were studying the captain's career course, which was blended. It was first asynchronous for a year, then synchronous for six months, then face-to-face -face at Fort Knox for a month. And people are dropping like flies because they didn't meet a human in the loop for a year and a half in the program. So while we move online, we have to have some best practices for interacting and getting feedback for people online. Indiana is growing. It's growing so much online, both graduate and undergraduate, that I predict, this is my pr prediction, I use line ends right there in 2019. By 2043, we'll have more online students at Indiana than face-to-face. -face. And I think that's too conservative. It might actually happen much, much sooner. We're starting to see parking spaces open up on campuses because we don't have as many students showing up on campus. Um, learning's much more synchronous. Here you've got a medical assistant helping from the Philippines the foot doctor, give the, you know, the medical records are called up via Zoom or Adobe Connect or something else. Here we've got the expert coming in uh, who's showing up in a MOOC. And that, that MOOC can be signed up. Anyone in the world could take that MOOC and learn from that person uh, teaching that MOOC. So learning is more from experts from MIT and Stanford. So the third part is customization. I see I'm out of time or about out of time here on my timer. So let me briefly go through a couple of things about customization and personalization. Flipping in the classroom would be a notion of ways to personalize because students watch the videos before class and you can personalize during class and individualize instruction during class. Blended is another example of personalizing and that's the second breakout I'll be going through the blended learning, and I brought one copy of my handbook of blended learning to give away at that second session. Um, learning's more blended. We can have, you know, a case with a video and podcast and so forth that students watch, and then they come to class to discuss it. Learning's more modifiable. We can take and move chairs in the room, and I think the room I selected has movable chairs, and we can move them around. Learning's more personal in that you can have the chance to have uh, AI or other tools to grade papers and then you have more time as instructor to give individualized and personalized feedback like these Michigan professors. Or you can have augmented hearing so you can listen to a conversation in your own native language that might be going on in English, it tra translating it to your native language. Learning is also more on demand with Google Translate and kids today are translating their papers using Google Translate. It's not 100% uh, foolproof because they don't detect the errors that are in there, but it's getting better. Um, and you can now have a uh, discussion with uh, the robot, with an uh, uh, intelligent agent, with a conversational agent or a chat bot in English. And so we, you know, can talk to Alexa. We can talk to, um, let's see if I've got Alexa up here. Alexa, accept the call. Alexa, accept the call. Hey, Hey, Mom. Just ask to watch Amazon Video, YouTube, movie trailers, and more. Alexa, play number three. Again, for the sake of time, I just want to give you a sense of that. Chatbots are, grow are emerging at St. Louis, in St. Louis at Washington University, at Georgia Tech. A lot of people are using chatbots to, as an assistant to one's learning. I'll skip and go over that. At Arizona State, their chatbot is called Sunny. Uh, we also have... I want to show this too real briefly. The Metamorphoses. The Metamorphoses. By Franz Kafka. By Franz Kafka, 1915. Chapter one. Chapter one. One morning, as Gregor Samsa was waking up from anxious dreams, he discovered that That's in bed he had been. Okay. That's a computer voice. It's no longer that tinny, and it's got pauses and so forth. It's called Deep Zen. It's pretty. It's a cool website out of the UK. There's Talk to Books website from Google where you can type in the topic you're interested in, like coronavirus, and it'll pull out sections of different books and, and, um, and make them on display for you. So learning is more personalized over time. And in China, and I don't have time to show this one, they're using AI for kids' math 
in high school and middle school and giving them personalized feedback based on the questions that they got wrong. So I just, I, uh, you, can, you can watch this one on your own, it's just embedded in there. 然后您可以看到这套试卷上面所涉及到的每一个细节的知识点的一个正确剧情。可以看到。Also in China, they have a tool that lets you talk to them and learn Chinese. 你好，欢迎光临，几位？So the panda says, "Welcome to the restaurant. How many people are you?" I'm going to say we're two. 熊猫，两位。这边请。so he's learning how to order food in a restaurant. And they also have in China. Teachers at this primary school in China know exactly when someone isn't paying attention. These headbands measure each student's level of concentration. I just the have to play that. I'm sorry, you know. It's a little scary. It's a little scary. So, my new MOOC book is coming out. I'm just, you know, just put a couple of things up related to MOOCs. We need approximately 700 new universities a year for the 14 million new learners that are coming to university settings. And they can't be built fast enough. So we have to explore through digital means. And there's the unemployment problem across the world is an issue. We have to explore new ways of delivering instruction. And uh, fortunately, one, I, one solution is via online education and blended learning. And, and you see the numbers there, 110 million students enrolled in a MOOC last year, 13,500 of them. You see the growth. There's not a death of MOOCs, there's a growth of MOOCs. And we now have winter discounts to take a MOOC, 50% off over Christmas. They have Black, uh, after Black Friday, Black Monday, or Cyber, Cyber Monday. They have summer discounts as well. So this is a weird time. We're now discounting learning, you know, getting coupons and so forth. This is not the, the age that I grew up in. You know, we're, we're promoting learning. We're seeing Coursera on the television, have television commercials and so forth. And data scientists don't go to college. They just learn, my, my son's a data scientist. He learned everything on, uh, through online means. He's a sociology major. Um, my friend here took 600 moose. He took 250 as of a few years ago. He's now up to 600. And I met him in, at a conference in Scotland, and he got an award there for doing so. Uh, people are taking these and binge learning online. And his life changed as a result of this. So learning is much more massive, and we're getting micro-credentials to people, certificates, something on their resumes. And we need to rethink resumes and how to put all the learnings that happen besides your four years of college and graduate school and so forth, where is that gonna go on your resume? And who's taking these courses? And so who's taking the courses? What, what are you doing and what, why are you doing? You wanna learn something new. They wanna improve their performance. They wanna learn English. They wanna start a business, not get a degree. They're not taking these to get a degree. They're getting to improve themselves and their lives. And they're relatively young people doing this. I'm going to skip over this. So micro-credentials, learning at a more modular kind of basis is exploding. Google IT certificates is a case in point. 50,000 people learn from Google. So this is the new book that's come out on the left-hand side. And uh, my colleagues and Dr. Mimi Lee, who's not with us today, helped with the first two, and she did the forward to the book. And so we have six copies of this book to give away during today. Um, so are you tired of MOOCs? <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, these are the 30 ways that we went through today in this session, or some of them. We, we captured a bit of them. Uh, and what's next? There are several things. I'll just point out a couple of things in terms of what's next. Uh, maybe a medical robot uh, partner, having the, the doctor come in on the mobile device and, and talk to someone, give them clinical advice so he can't, doesn't have to travel there. More certificates for MOOC completion. Um, more video walls to pick our teachers and our students, our fellow students for the day. Um, having AI intelligent agents to give us some counseling. Professor Einstein at our desk. I think universities in 10 years will have a robot in every classroom that will, could serve as a partner. 
a collaborative partner. And um, we'll be talking to dead people because we'll be recording everything in one's life and they'll be able to recreate a person's life and what they would, how they would respond. And it's already happening with musicians. And as I said, uh, instructional designers will be learning environment engineers. So we've gone through a lot of stuff in a little over an hour, including the rise of the digital learner, including the rise of the unemployed worker, including the rise of new ways to think about learning and learning environments, and the Education 2020 model. Hopefully you've got some ideas, and hopefully on your yellows, you got one idea no one else has thought about. And you'll be able to put that on the door as you leave today. So is it an ev evolution or is it a revolution? Who says evolution? Who says revolution? Okay, quite a, quite a few people say evolution. Some still say evolution. My minions and I think it's a revolution. We're at a jumping off point. So I need everyone to stand up with me. And at the count of three, all the ladies will jump with me because it's Valentine's Day. One, two, three. Oh, they're jumping for me. All the men, one, two, three. And everyone together, one, two, three. Okay, you have a seat for just a second. We're at a jumping off point. This is Valentine's Day. I want to thank you for coming for the first talk. I hope you can attend one of the, one of the two other ones. T Dr. Reeves will also be there this afternoon. Um, I hope you have a great Valentine's Day. And if you don't get any chocolates uh, from this morning, I'll have some this afternoon. Uh, anyone want to say something before we go to break? We will take about a 10-minute break uh, and come back all smiley-faced, ask me questions in break. So thank you very much.